quick, quick request from you, Callum, uh, f- for you, Callum, as it were. Can you please ping me a list in Teams chat of everyone in alphabetical order, just so that I've got it to hand? Oh, hang on, let me just see if it's in email. Oh, there it is. There it is. Um, yeah, it's been um, it's been a, uh, a a rather busy day again. So, so let me just open that. Okay, I've got it here. Thank you very much, Callum, for that. Okay, so let's pull that out of there. Pull that stuff there. There. Okay, I've now got everything to hand. That's helpful. Okay, right. So, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to another virtual edition of the Over- Corp- uh, Community and Corporate Overview and Scrutiny Meeting. We have got uh, two 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 main items on the agenda tonight, which is the uh, Community Safety Partnership and also the Burial Ground update. We've then also got the uh, the, pl- the forward agenda, uh, but just a few housekeeping things before we start. Uh, can I ask that every ha- one has their mobile devices, Alexas, Google Boxes, etc., and phones switched off? Uh, if you're not speaking or uh, being asked to speak, please mute your mu- mute your microphone. Uh, in a, um, or it will be muted for you. And also to assist people in viewing the meeting, could everyone turn off the cameras and only turn to you when you are speaking? Um, so to introduce everyone in attendance, we have um, we have got uh, Councillor, myself, Councillor Guy Grandison in the chair, uh, Councillor Abdul Lloyd, Callum, Officer Callum Wareham, Councillor Clive Jones, Councillor Keith Baker, uh, Officer Narinda Bar, Bra, Brara, I apologise, I can't, I'm looking at that, my brain skipped. Officer Neil Carr, Officer Nigel Bailey, Councillor Oliver Whittle, Councillor Paul Fishwick and Councillor Shirley Boyd. Have I missed anyone there, Callum? Uh, no, that, that, that's the lot. And uh, also, I presume that this is being broadcast and webcast live via your OBS system, Callum? Correct, we're live. Okay, so we are all good and live. So that covers the initial uh, the initial thing, but I just want to give. Uh, have we had before we do the apologies? Uh, I would just like to do a quick thing. Uh, as everyone knows, there was a very tragic event in Forbury Gardens in Reading on Saturday evening. So I would quite like to just have a a minute's pause of reflection and silence in memory of those who have been hurt and especially to the families and friends of those that were lost, including one of our teachers here. But we have David Wales, Joe Ritchie Bennett and James Forlong, who sadly lost their lives to that tragic event. So if we could just take a moment to pause and reflect for a minute. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, and just joining the meeting, Councillor Graham Howe. Uh, so, uh, moving on after that moment of reflection in 
remembrance, as it were, of and in of those that lost their lives on Saturday. Uh, do we ha- have? I don't believe there's any apologies we've had now, Callum. Now that Graham's appeared. Uh, no, no apologies, chair. Okay, minutes of the previous meeting. Um, we have two sets of minutes. The first one is from the extraordinary meeting last week, and then from uh, from last time we met in January. Uh, does anyone have any comments on those minutes or any corrections? Oh, Clive, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've got uh, a few comments on the minutes of the meeting, 13th of January. So in item number 45, which was the minutes of the previous meeting, uh, have we had any news on a grant from the Football Foundation, which can be used at Canty Park? Um, it's Callum here, Clive. Um, yeah. Not that I'm aware of. I will ask no. Graham um, for any update. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. I've got, I've got a few guys. Yep. So, Just remember uh, to do, read out the page numbers when yes, you're doing it. Page page eleven. Then uh, the borough. This is about the borough design guide, and uh, we were hoping to. Uh, start looking at this in late 2020 so probably starting very soon and uh, I wonder if Nigel can tell us when he is actually going to start looking at it I assume it has been delayed because of COVID-19. John do you respond chair? Um, Uh, Sorry yes go ahead Nigel sorry. sorry Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, we sent out the, the questionnaire to everybody, all councillors. We only had one response back from all councillors to the questionnaire identifying which areas they felt need to be worked on, which areas need to be improved. So we've only had that one response. And that wasn't from me, was it, Nigel? It certainly wasn't. I didn't like to no. point it out, Clive, when it wasn't Apologies. from you. <laughs> Apologies. Would you mind sending it again? Maybe... I- I Maybe think it might be worth send it to all councillors. I think it should be sent out again and just prodded uh, simply. And even if it's only but only saying, can you please respond to this by the end of next week or something? Um, I know that everything kind of went crazy, uh, yeah. but it's no excuse to have. It, 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 it's probably it has probably slipped through everyone's email boxes in the gaps, but we need, do need to keep up the feedback. I would say that realistically, you know, given where it's going on with COVID and everything else, we're unlikely to look at this until the very end of this this calendar year, realistically. But I'll certainly send that back out again. OK, yep. thank you very much. That's it for me, Guy. Thank you. OK, no worries. Um, so is, has anyone else got any questions? Shirley? Uh, no. Okay, sorry, I just saw you come off mute. Okay, if anyone's got, if, if any, if with that, if anyone has any objections to to me signing the minutes at some point in the near future, uh, can you please raise raise it raise them now? Uh, if not, I will take it as we are accepting the minutes as uh, read, other than a couple of questions. Okay. Callum, I'll have to arrange to come into an office and sign them at some point. No rush. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I really... This is the advantage of having a piece of paper sometimes. So, uh, minutes of the previous meeting, public question time. Uh, Oh, sorry, declarations of interest. Has anyone got any declarations of interest? I assume that's a no. Uh, Public question time. Have we received any public questions? None received, Uh, yet. Okay. Member question time. Do we had any members? None received. Okay, so we move on straight to uh, agenda item 10, the Community Safety Partnership. Um, So um, is is that you taking it, Narinda? It is, Chair, yes. Thank you. Apologies, I'm saying names wrong. I'm I'm reading them out as I read them. No, that's fine. Can I ask everyone, can I also remind everyone to turn their cameras on if they've got them uh, when speaking? Mine will be going off for a minute.
So go ahead, Narinda. I haven't. I have a problem with my camera, so I, I won't. Oh, don't worry then if it's yeah. if it's not working. As I said, if people have got them. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. And um, the community safety partnership um, annual report. The uh, just just to provide members with a with a overview really of the report. So the key objective of the community safety partnership is to uh, work collectively with its members to address crime and disorder substance misuse and antisocial behaviour across the whole of the borough. The partnership statutory members, just to take members through, include the police, uh, national probation service, health, fire and um, probation service. So um, in terms of the recommendations in this report, the members of this committee are asked to note the contents um, and also to review the next steps in terms of the partnership work plan and consider how they may support the community safety partnership in delivering its priorities over the next 12 months or so. So in terms of key highlights for the report, the main thing to highlight to members is that we've had some key developments in the as part of the community safety partnership board um, so during 2019 the board has been appointed a new chair which is now the local police area commander superintendent felicity parker and following a period of interim arrangements and um, temporary arrangements, the partnership, Community Safety Partnership now has a permanent experienced Community Safety Partnership manager in place. Um, so that's all been really important in terms of reinvigorating the partnership and the work of the board and delivering the priorities. I'll move on then at this point to the performance summary. So the key things to note in the performance summary all crime, which covers all of the uh, crimes across the district, which are recorded on Thames Valley Police National Recording Computer, suggests that we, in this period, have had an increase of crime of 8.5%, and that's a year-on-year -year increase compared to the same period last year. So that's April to May. 1819 compared to April to March, sorry, April to March 1819 compared to April to March 2020. Um, the actual change in terms of the numbers of crimes across the district that have increased, across the borough, sorry, that have increased to 598 actual recorded crimes in terms of incidents. So we've had a number of decreases across the, of the of, across the performance summary including residential burglary, burglaries in sheds and garages and also an in decrease in antisocial behaviour in terms of our housing reported incidents as well as antisocial behaviour noted by Thames Valley Police which has uh, seen a reduction of 8.6% and, and a reduction in housing of 9% respectively. Um, uh, Members will be able to see there are a number of crime categories where we are seeing increases and have seen increases over the past year, including violence with injury, domestic abuse, which has seen an increase of 35 um, percent. And that's 330 actual crimes recorded. And then also an increase in terms of drugs, possession offences recorded by Thames Valley Police, as well as vehicle crime offences, which uh, we continue to work in partnership to tackle. Um, moving on to the table in terms of MARAC cases. So these are multi-agency crime, uh, multi-agency conferences with respect to dealing with a high risk domestic abuse cases. Uh, the figures indicate there that we've seen a, a, a doubling in terms of the number of cases that are now coming to the Wokingham MARAC um, we've got 128 cases compared to 66. Um, highlighting then going on to 
um, domestic homicide reviews staying on the sort of MARAC and the domestic abuse agenda side of the Community Safety Partnership. We have uh, a number of domestic homicide reviews that have uh, been undertaken across the borough. We are currently uh, undertaking our fourth domestic homicide review. Um, and this is a, an instrument that the partnership uses to review any serious um, fatalities, any fatalities that have occurred. So where we do get a, um, a murder, the Community Safety Partnership has a statutory duty to investigate uh, what occurred and what steps each partner agency took with respect to reducing the risk in that case. Um, like I said, we're, we're on our fourth domestic homicide review currently uh, and we hope to conclude that um, uh, during the summer to have a report to publish once the Home Office is uh, satisfied with the work we've done on that. Um, moving on to priority two which is tackling antisocial behaviour, harmful misuse and organised crime. Um, so we've had uh, in, t in terms of our antisocial behaviour response uh, the key thing to, to to highlight to members and committee members is um, we've undertaken a secondment with Thames Valley Police with a, a full time secondment from one of their officers is now currently working in the community safety partnership to deal with antisocial behaviour incidents uh, across the borough and look at a detailed incident response to members and to um, the community in terms of how, and victims, in terms of how we respond to antisocial behaviour. Um, one of the key things I'd probably like to highlight in terms of uh, uh, Operation Oedipus, which is a neighbourhood uh, policing operation into Class A and Class B drug dealing in the, in the Wokingham area. Um, we've had a very successful uh, operation that the Thames Valley Police colleagues bid for some forced surveillance teams and using covert tactics, we were able to obtain sufficient evidence of drug dealing um, in the locality. Drugs were seized um, and uh, we are currently awaiting the, the, um, uh, the, the results of that operation. Um, I'll move on to some of the the, the, the engagement that we have with young people. The KICKS project and Positive Pathways are both projects that we use to engage with young people across the borough. KICKS project uses uh, the football partnership that we have with Reading Football Club to deliver a number of different projects um, outside of school and attached to some of the school facilities as well to engage and divert young people from antisocial behaviour. Um, and we have a very strong partnership with uh, Reading Football Club that we um, are looking to uh, uh, develop over the next 12 months or so. Um, substance misuse, we with respect to substance misuse, we have undertaken a needs assessment across the borough um, and that's shown us um, a number of evidence-led um, evidence -led information um, which gives us really key information around where we should be tackling and targeting some of our resources with respect to substance misuse issues, um, both for young people and for adults. So number th the two key issues really for the partnership with respect to that is the, the, the issues around cannabis use amongst young people and also around alcohol treatment for, for adults and um, supporting adults with alcohol um, assistance. Moving on to the report, priority three, which is reduce and prevent exploitation and the needs of young and vulnerable offenders. Um, working, the, the, one of the key priorities for the Police and Crime Commissioner is to uh, recognise and work with vulnerable victims um, and supporting vulnerable victims with decreasing their levels of offending. Um, and this is something that the partnership are working closely with the Police and Crime Commissioner. Um, in terms of assisting uh, probation colleagues to divert and um, assist victims. Um, we know that our victims are likely to be younger 
And also we know that they're likely to be uh, engaged in violence related offences together with theft and harassment. So the partnership is undertaking uh, joint work with the probation service and the police and crime commissioner about how we successfully tackle um, that, that this area of, of work. Um, I think just to highlight really to, to members that the partnership is also undertaken uh, and is an active member of the Wokingham MRAC um, board, which is the um, uh, young people that are um, missing um, or at risk of exploitation. Um, so there's a multi-agency group that the partnership is part of that looks at our response to how we deal with young people that are missing um, or at risk of being exploited by um, being very nature of being vulnerable themselves and being drawn into uh, crimes and antisocial behaviour and um, county drugs lines issues um, that, uh, although far and few between across the borough, um, do exist. Um, empowering and enabling the resilience of local communities. So we've been working hard to try and establish our relationship with the neighbourhood action groups. Um, and uh, while some of that work has obviously been delayed and um, paused at this moment in time, um, we are looking to re-establish very strong links with the neighbourhood action groups. Um, and also, uh, what, what, no more poignant or, or, or salient at the moment than is our sort of duty to work really closely with respect to the prevent agenda, which is our the partnerships uh, duties and response under the Counter Terrorism and Security Act. So we have reinvigorated the prevent board um, this year. We've appointed a uh, new prevent chair and also really reinvigorated and had a robust look at. Um, our uh, response to channel. So channel panel is the element of the prevent, which actually looks at prevent is the strategic um, element and then prevent, uh, sorry, channel is, is, is the element that looks at the multi-agency safeguarding yeah. response around individuals that would be of concern or have been referred into the prevent team to have a look at um, what information is known about them and how we as a multi-agency panel would respond to um, dealing with concerns about individuals and, and counter-terrorism concerns locally. Um, staffing, uh, the Community Safety Manager's post, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, has been vacant had been vacant for for a, for a quite a significant period of time and my appointment was made uh, at the end of the summer last year um, and since then uh, we've made uh, quite large um, changes and uh, invigorating some of the reinvigorating some of the good work that was um, in place at that time um, the community safety partnership also in terms of funding we do receive a grant we do receive a grant, so um, we have £104,000 allocated us to allocated to us from the Police and Crime Commissioner, um, and then that is um, the, that spend is approved and monitored very closely on a quarterly basis by the Police and Crime Commissioner to ensure that we're spending it um, wisely. And that um, concludes my presentation of the report, Chair. OK, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Miranda. So I'm going to go in alphabetical order, everyone. So uh, Keith, you're first up. Uh, thank you. <coughs> thank you very much for that comprehensive uh, uh, summary of a very detailed document. Um, Mike, I've got a question on kicks. Um, you sort of loosely uh, suggested where the kicks uh, experience or work or whatever is is happening. Uh, could you expand on that? Particularly, you know, is it um, happening elsewhere rather than just straight working? Them? Yep. So sorry, I had trouble on meeting then. The, so the KICS project we have implemented across um, different locations in the borough. Um, 
it is uh, some of the sessions are based in and around some of our schools, um, secondary schools, and um, the sessions are uh, on a weekly basis and um, they're open to all and they're free sessions. Um, they are with uh, qualified coaches, as you would expect, um, and they have a, some of the sessions have a, have a really, really positive and good turnout. Um, some of the sessions dip in and out of um, attendance and um, the work undertaken as part of the sessions not only is around actual coaching of football, but also it, it touches on wider um, engagement with young people around the substance misuse agenda, around antisocial behaviour, about knife crime, um, drugs, and um, so on and so forth, and sexual exploitation and other exploitation of, of young people. And it's, um, yeah, so, so that's some of the work that's uh, going on in different locations. What I can do if it's helpful is um, provide a detailed list of the locations where the sessions are being undertaken, if that's helpful. That would be very, very helpful. Thank you. Anything else, Keith? Nope. Okay. Shirley. Hello, yes. Um, yeah, thank you. That was, that was a very interesting report. Um, it's just a couple of observations, really. Um, there's a very large increase in the uh, recorded incidents of uh, domestic abuse. Um, is, is that uh, because uh, they're being recorded in a different way or uh, more things are being included? Or is this genuinely... Um, uh, have we got a really worrying problem on our hands with domestic ab abuse increasing in, in that way? Um, this is my first question. And um, I'll ask the two questions together, if you don't mind. And the other one is, um, regarding MRAC, uh, I just wondered how many vulnerable young people are currently on the, on the radar of, uh, of the MRAC team? Thank you. Yep, so in, in order of uh, questions, increase the the increases that we've seen, um, really in terms of increases, we, we always tend to um, explain increases in terms of um, a positive thing. It, domestic abuse can be a very, very hidden crime um, and all agencies involved in domestic abuse will um, rightfully uh, always indicate that it is a very hidden crime it can be a very hidden crime so trying to get on average a victim will suffer 35 offences before they seek the support of any agency um, so in terms of increasing our numbers it's very much is around that we see that as a very positive thing um, increasing reports means that people have the confidence um, around uh, reporting the incident and being ready to seek um, advice and help um, so in terms of increasing that, that you know, we, we're very much encouraged and it is the direction of travel that we would want to go with um, to try and identify victims. Some of it is around um, some of it, but only a very small percentage, I have to say, is around a change in recording in the way that we record offences or Thames Valley Police is now recording offences, um, but not um, a large, that is, um, you know, the, the proportion of incidents that are on the increase locally are what we would call a true reflection of an increase of actual incidents. And that, I think if I put that slightly in context of a national picture, as a national and regional picture, um, we are seeing the same trend nationally and regionally um, up and down the country. So this isn't a um, uh, an area that we're uh, exclusively seeing an increase in, uh, in terms of just Wokingham. In terms of your second question around MRAC, um, I couldn't categorically tell you the numbers of young people on MRAC at the moment, um, simply because that list goes up and down on a monthly basis. Um, but again, I can uh, um, I can look that up and give you an accurate figure. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, uh, Paul. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, first of all, on page 16, the table, the drug offences, possession incidents have risen by 38.5% and the theft of vehicles risen by 32.5% um, compared to the previous year. Is there a reason behind those particular increases? And my second question is again around the KICS project. 
how long is the project funded for and what's the plans for going forward and how is the success of the project measured? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so in terms of the drugs offences, the um, in, in terms of monitoring activity around the drugs offences, we would very much um, state that that um, increase is based on police activity. So we will very much see um, it, it, where police activity um, around drug offences and, and drug incidents increases um, and there is more of a push and more an emphasis on drug related um, operations as the one I spoke about in the as part of the report, um, we will see an increase in those numbers coming up. So that is one element. The other element to probably um, highlight to members is that because we have um, um, Loddon Valley Police Station on our locality, um, some of the offences that are picked up, so some offences where p offenders may be arrested, um, and then are brought to the um, cu well, brought to custody. If then they are found in possession of drugs once they arrive at custody, that can also account for a number of offences as well. So those are really the sort of main issues around the recording in terms of an increase of recording of the drug offences. Vehicle crime um, in terms of theft from vehicle. Uh, was it theft of or theft from? Sorry, your question around. It, it's theft of vehicles uh, has risen by 32.5%. Yeah, um, I mean, in terms of uh, theft of vehicle, um, working in borough, as we'll know, is um, it, we, we are a very affluent borough. Um, and we do um, unfortunately have, because of that, some of the issues, burglary and vehicle crime, um, issues that come with um, some of the problems of being an affluent borough, one of which is we have a high car ownership um, within the locality. And we are also um, means that, you know, people like to, offenders like to travel into the borough, unfortunately, um, to um, commit these offences. So burglary and vehicle theft, um, sometimes they can often, very often be connected. So you'll have what we call um, a burglary which um, is undertaken specifically just to um, recover the keys from a vehicle. So we've seen a number of those types of offences in the locality where, um, you know, offenders will, will will get groups of offenders that travel into the borough and um, they're, they're, they're travelling criminals. So they will come up from Surrey up to Hampshire, up to um, Wokingham and, and, and travelling through to commit these sorts of offences because um, we have... Um, you know, uh, uh, vehicles that, that they are interested in. So that unfortunately is uh, part of the makeup of the borough. Um, so are, are these like a stolen to order type theft? Yes, I mean, they are very much when we get um, a lot of these offences, they will be high vehicle, high performance um, cars. Uh, that they're interested in and they 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 will be um, one of two things either related to um, theft for order and they will be um, then shipped abroad um, before you know the authorities and 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 um, those concerned can you know can track them down or they will be um, you know stolen for um, purposes of being involved in further offences so those are the main two types of um, issues with respect to theft of vehicle. Moving on to the KICS project then, um, in terms of the KICS project, the, the way that the KICS project is, is currently funded is it's funded um, three ways. It's funded partly from tenant services it's partly funded by the Community Safety Partnership and then it's partly also funded by our leisure team, leisure and um, uh, sports team, um, with the recognition that um, clearly the, the, the project um, engages a number of different young people from a different number of different um, backgrounds. And um, so that's the way that the project is currently funded. Um, they, I do believe that there is funding for this next financial year going forward up until 
uh, 31st of March 21. So that's currently in place. I mean, it's been difficult, um, as you would imagine, to deliver a kicks project, a football based project um, during times um, that we're in at the moment. Um, and what we uh, done at this moment in time is worked in partnership with Reading Football Club to deliver a, an online facility in terms of a kicks project, which is very much based around supporting young people and online gaming, um, uh, online football gaming. So we've changed tact uh, slightly in, in recent times um, to engage young people on a virtual platform. Um, in terms of the measures of success, um, we have a clear set of um, key performance indicators that we would like the KICS project and we ask the KICS project to um, to report back on, um, which includes numbers, sessions, um, and then the success of, of, of young people within the project. So any softer measures of success that we may see in terms of young people and their behaviour or their attitudinal, attitudinal um, success uh, that, the, that the project monitors. Thank you. Anything, anything else, Paul? I, I have some others, but I'll ask those on the way back. Okay, doke. Okay, so it's actually, I just realised it's actually me. Um, uh, so, my camera. so I've got a couple of questions here. Thank you. First of all, thanks for a very concise report in this regards. So following on from a couple of points, the, with the KICKS project and the engagement with um, individuals over a virtual means, how has that been received and how successful has that been or is it too early to tell? Yes, um, you kind of preempted the question. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, quite, it's very early days with that. Um, we've only just managed to get sort of the consents and the um, safeguarding protocols in place, really, to be able to to get that in place. As you can imagine, that's been quite a, um, a difficult thing to to try and get right in terms of engaging with young people online. So uh, early days, but I'm happy to report back um, at a later stage. That'd be useful to know. Thank you. And the other aspect is the increase in the reported domestic abuses. Uh, mentioned previously with it being up by about a third is this because effectively we've had in effect greater success in awareness and encouraging more people to come forward and having a better support network um because is this is the increase actually cases that were happening previously that we didn't know about but because of what's been done with awareness and support network, et cetera, people, more people are now coming forward. Yes, so exactly that, that um, in terms of people's confidence in reporting. So really um, domestic abuse and uh, the reporting of domestic abuse or hate crime um, incidents will really be around the confidence of victims to come forward to, with the ability to know that they can seek help um, and where to go for that help. So um, uh, like, a, uh, like I touched on previously, victims before they attempt to seek any help on average will suffer um, approximately 35 incidents of domestic abuse of varying degrees um, before they actually have the confidence to come forward. So it's really, really important um, when victims do come forward um, and and look to seek that help that we get um, you know we get our services and our offer to that victim absolutely correct in terms of the way we engage with them and the way we um, the, the the services that we offer so yeah okay thank you uh, right so that's my questions done so Graham do you have any questions Uh, yes, please. A again, thank you very much for the uh, comprehensive report. But uh, by the nature of these things, they're retrospective and talking mainly about 2018-2019. The um, profile of criminality uh, will have changed, particularly in the last four to five months. Uh, I know within my own portfolio, uh, within Children's Services, we are expecting uh, domestic abuse to raise its head. Uh, the reportage has been down for the last few months, uh, but will start increasing, particularly from the time that children go back to school. 
What do you see is going to be the changes given the environment that there has been for the last six months, or sorry, three to four months? Uh, and, 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 you know, what will the private protect, public protection partnership do to learn out of that? Uh, because the profiles that are being reported statistically now, do you believe also, like I, that they will change? That's my question. Uh, yes. So part of what we've been doing very recently is as as our measures to keep a really close eye on domestic abuse um, uh, as part of the lockdown. Um, you know, we had um, huge concerns at the beginning of lockdown around the numbers of um, people uh, suffering with domestic abuse and not being able to access help um, freely and not being able to, um, you know, have the space to be able to contact services. Um, and also being locked down in lockdown with their perpetrator because domestic abuse is the type of crime where the perpetrator is very often or not um, known to the victim. So um, as part of this, we have um, an I chair a, um, a, a weekly meeting with the local service provider, the CCG. Um, so our local service provider is Berkshire Women's Aid, um, the CCG colleagues, safeguarding leads, the Thames Valley Police Marac chair, um, myself and also um, two other local boroughs, so um, our neighbouring boroughs. Um, and in terms of monitoring this very, very closely, um, we have been, like I said, undertaking those weekly meetings to keep a really, really close eye on things. We haven't to this point seen um, a picture which um, al alarms us. Um, the, the the picture at the moment is stable in terms of the numbers of victims coming forward to seek help. They are within the um, parameters of where we would expect them to be normally. Um, at right, as you say, right at the beginning of lockdown, what was more concerning to us was actually the figures were absolutely really, really flat, um, where no victims were coming forward whatsoever at all. Um, that has begun now to climb. Um, so we've come from a period of stability, which we still are, to a period where we expect the issues, as you rightly pointed out, to climb as the lockdown is relaxed. So we know um, that's going to happen. And in terms of our capacity and our ability to deal with that, we have um, increased um, sort of our capacity with the local service provider by changing things changing the way that they're doing business so um taking the resources that they've already got locally um and just changing them doing them slightly differently to be able to increase the capacity in in anticipation for that spike okay so as a supplementary then could you give us some examples on what those changes are because uh the def you know i would expect car crime for example to have been quite low in the last three months given that people shouldn't be motoring around and will now increase again but can you give some examples particularly in the abuse area um where the partnership is uh, providing that capacity. I, I, I'd like to see some, um, you know, structural answers, as it were. Um, so, in terms of, uh, as you say, the, the the nature of the crime has changed. You know, taking the sort of trends and natures of of what we would traditionally see has. So, for example, two 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 areas, as you rightfully um, do suggest. I mean, car crime was one of those that went absolutely. Um, you know very very low we were still getting car um crime related issues though they weren't theft from vehicle they weren't theft of vehicle um or burglary related offenses they completely tailed off um absolutely for the first three months of lockdown they have begun to climb and rise again now as people are leaving their properties and attending work or going out um and also um in terms of um, but yeah, so burglary offences completely um, went down. We had absolutely nothing. But in terms of um, vi actually offenders travelling into the uh, borough to commit car related offences, we still had those occurring. So theft um, from vehicle where you'd have um, uh, an area done with um, 
things left in the in the vehicles being still stolen that they, they, they were unfortunately still occurring um, we've, we've also seen an absolute rise and increase and in spike in antisocial behavior related offenses over the lockdown period as well where people are confined to their properties um, and we are seeing um, some estates and some pockets across the borough um, where housing um, you know ha- housing is uh, the key issue where people are not adhering to social distancing and they are um, flouting those by having parties and staying awake till 3 a.m. whilst their neighbour actually um, has is, is either a key worker or has to go to work or has children and so on and so forth. So some of those some of those change some of those changes have been where we wouldn't traditionally see such a huge spike or such a huge increase and in hotspot in those. And actually, in terms of the antisocial behaviour, we've 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 seen a change in tact. So we've we've certainly, in terms of increasing our enforcement ability and increasing our visibility to get, together with police colleagues, um, and also um, looking at um, you know working with the police colleagues to encourage the use of fixed penalty notices that they have the powers to 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 deliver um and so on and so forth really so some of those those are just some of the changes well that we've had to put in place um around the sort of antisocial behavior um space and um the domestic abuse one that i mentioned before those are those are sort of the the key ones if i'm honest um the other one probably to mention is um fraud offenses have also increased during the lockdown period so we've seen an increase in fraud offences, um, particularly those targeted at more of the elderly and vulnerable um, sections of the community that are um, more likely to fall victim to fraud and um, scams type offences. So um, right at the beginning of lockdown, we saw scams offences that were around selling fake PPE or offering to disinfect um, driveways um, or um, that sort of thing, really, if I'm honest. Um, And then that has changed tact actually in recent weeks um, to what we are seeing now and not so much reported locally, but certainly regionally and nationally around um, the uh, NHS Trace, Track and um, Inform app uh, where people are being contacted, um, the be- people are being told that they're, they're receiving cold calls out of the blue or messages from scamsters um, suggesting that they are from the NHS and that um, they have been victim, well not victim, they've been in contact with a COVID patient um, and that uh, in order to get te- positive test results, they should download um, a fi- a, a, an app that's going to cost them five hundred pounds to be able to get that information. So uh, we've seen a ta- we've seen a change in tact of offenders and offending type behaviour, um, and we've had to change our what we would you know tra- the sort of ways that we're doing business in terms of. Um, engaging with people. So one of the things we've done to um, combat the fraud issue, for example, is um, with the um, information that's gone out as part of the food parcels, we've tried to put informa- we've put information in with those, so written information for victims. And we've also provided information to the buddying scheme, which we've set up as part of the council's um, COVID-19 response, so that if uh, people are contacted, when people are contacted, and a number of different cohorts shielding contact uh, shielding list was contacted, uh, 3,000 plus people, uh, one-to-one information was given to them about scams and 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 fraud information and and any concerns that they may have. So we've changed tact um, uh, quite, quite considerably in terms of trying to tackle some of these offences that we've seen come to the forefront. Thank you. I, I mean, the last thing I'd just say, I mean, very very briefly, is that I, the st- statistics that I would expect to see in a year's time are quite different to what we're seeing today. Uh, which are circumstantial. And um, uh, what what I uh, heard in your last statement there is some proactive uh, actions to address what is foreseeable. And uh, that is good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. thank you, Graham. Uh, Over to you, Clive. Yeah, thank you, Guy, and uh, uh, thank you, Narinda, for a very comprehensive report. 
Can I ask you on page uh, 17, your priority one, uh, uh, the last paragraph talks about uh, Berkshire Women's Aid uh, working very closely with children's services uh, so that uh, the children have the necessary support that they require. What, what have we done recently that is new practice that we might have learned from uh, neighbouring authorities or other authorities within the country? Are, are we actively seeking out uh, best practice? I'm assuming that we are. I just want you to confirm it. Yes, definitely. We are seeking out best practice, both from neighbouring authorities um, and from a Thames Valley wide uh, perspective. So uh, myself, I am the link for the Thames Valley wide domestic uh, coordinators uh, partnership. So we share best practice on a regular basis. We're in contact via email and quarterly meetings. Um, and, um, you know, that best practice is also uh, born out of um, it, conversations with the DA commissioner, which um, who has been in, in, in contact with us over over COVID times in terms of supporting um, victims and, and how we may best do that um, differently um, over these challenging times. Um, and also in terms of um, drawing on best practice also nationally and looking at um, more innovative ways in terms of tackling offenders. So um, looking at how we put in programmes that work better and work to tackle both the offenders um, of domestic abuse, but also um, in, in terms of supporting the victims in, in good practice as well. So, uh, yes, is the, is the short answer. Uh, fine, thanks. Uh, and then page 18, domestic homicide uh, review. We're hoping to have a report concluded by June 2020, but it's obviously been uh, uh, delayed because of COVID-19. Will we see a copy of that report? Uh, yes, you will. The copy of the report will be uh, circulated uh, and um, it is. It, we, we also have a duty to publish the findings from that report as well um, and uh, publish on our website and also widely circulate the lessons learnt and the action plan um, from that domestic homicide review. So absolutely, we'll, we will ensure that you see a copy of that. Yeah, OK, thanks. And then page 19, Operation uh, Oedipus. Mm -hmm. So I think we should be congratulating the whole team there that we uh, have brought some people to book, or hopefully we have. And uh, let's hope we have some successful prosecu prosecutions to get these people off the street. Yeah, yeah. And yes, then, pass those on to police colleagues. Yeah. And uh, positive pathways right at the end of that paragraph, which comes on to uh, page 20. We've got the uh, Only Falls Carry Knives event that has had to be po postponed. Do you have a date for when that is going to be rescheduled? Uh, we don't at the moment. Um, again, as soon as there's a date, we're happy to, to, to send that round. It's really um, Yes, yeah, happy to send the date round as soon as one is. We're, we're very eager to get that um, event uh, back in place. Uh, OK. And would uh, would councillors be able to attend that? I can certainly ask. Yeah. OK. And then uh, engagement with young people. Have you got uh, 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 some more some more detail that you can give us here? We... Early Town Council, and I'm the leader of uh, Early Town Council, decided uh, at the turn of the municipal year that we were going to spend more money on youth service provision. But I don't think that we've actually spoken to anybody in the borough about doing that. We're doing our own thing, but maybe we should be having some conversations perhaps with you or maybe some other people. 
Uh, yes, I'd certainly welcome a conversation um, at any point um, with respect to that. In terms of our uh, youth engagement, it's it's one of those things that um, falls across um, uh, lots of different areas. So whilst localities team um, do do some level of youth engagement, obviously I've talked about some of the um, areas of work that we're involved in with respect to different projects that we've put in place. But also I, I, I know that the um, Children and Young People's Partnership um, is also Children and Young People's Partnership, which is chaired by Carol Camus, is also looking at um, youth provision and our uh, sort of offer in terms of, uh, you know, ensuring that it, what, what we have um, in place is joined up and also fit for purpose um, for young people. And then uh, the next item, which is substance misuse. You've got all these next steps. Have you got any timelines for when you expect some of these things to happen? I'm just having a look through. They've got varying timelines. Um, we expect them to happen within the next 12 months. Um, but obviously, it, it, you know, we're in... Um, interesting times in terms of um, delivery locally so um, we, we certainly still they are still certainly part of the delivery plan for the next 12 months and we do still hope to have them in place for the next 12 months okay so so you're hoping all of these are going to be covered by the budget 2021-22 yes we hope so um, yeah. if yeah, so we, I'm sure. <laughs> we, um, uh, what, we'll, what will sit behind this will be a, another detailed action plan, which will draw out some of the next steps and also the timelines as well for delivery. Um, so those can that can be circulated to members when it's um, okay. it, when it's completed. And then, and then my last last question, you'll be pleased to know, Guy, is uh, uh, priority four, uh, where you talk about neighbourhood. I attend the early neighbourhood action group two or three times a year. I don't attend all six meetings. I think my average is about three over the years. And I, I can't remember seeing anybody from localities there for some time. Yes, you're quite right. So um, part of the sort of key link um, as soon as I come online um, has been around this. So um, January was the agreed action for it, for it to be allocated to a team member in localities. Um, and then unfortunately, we've um, straight away sort of slipped into the, 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 the COVID pandemic. So um, uh, we do hope um, that um, we can attend uh, where localities have been allocated um, a a meeting across the borough each so there should be very very good attendance now from the localities team in each one of those to be able to feedback concerns and issues to um, the community safety partnerships problem solving tasking group so that we can look at um, uh, we, we can look at collectively responding to all of those. All right. Well I think when you come along to the early neighbourhood action group you'll be Quite surprised. It's uh, sometimes quite a lively meeting. <laughs> OK, thank you very much, Guy. And thank you, Narinda, for all those answers. I was about to say it's Narinda you need to thank, not me. <laughs> me on that regard, Clive. Uh, no, I'm okay. thanking you for giving me the time. <laughs> <laughs> Abdul, your turn. Thank you, guys. Well, hi, Narinda. Can you all hear me? Hello. Yeah, you're clear. Oh, yes, fine. Right, now, I've got um, three questions. First of all, you mentioned in your report religiously racially aggravated 77 cases. Could you tell me, is this place of worship or from workplace or from public transport? First one. Second question is, I think, Clive has touched on, Bakshia Women Aids. What are you doing about preventive work, prevention, and how many cases from working in last year have you been dealing with? And thirdly, the OPCC has recently commissioned a range of wide services, including BAMER and BAWD. What was your finding in this group? 
Thank you. Chair, I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to ask for the questions to be repeated. I've, I've got a really bad line. Uh, Abdul, can you repeat, please? Yes. Well, first question was religiously racially aggravated 77 cases. I would like to know where this happened. Is this place of work, place of worship, or in public transport? First one. Second one. Second question was about Berkshire women. I would like to know what prevention work are you doing? and how many cases from Workingham they have dealt with last year, and what is it costing us? And third question is mine. The OPCC has recently commissioned range of white services, including DAMER, DAWG. What was your finding in these groups? So with respect to the racially and religiously aggravated crimes. Um, I'm afraid I don't have the breakdown of uh, specifically of those crimes. Um, again, we can we can look to break those down and uh, report those back to members. Um, the sec your second question around uh, BWA. Yeah. Um, around capacity and trying to retain the service is um, I touched on earlier, which was around um, really working closely with BWA to keep a, um, a very open dialogue in terms of the local service provider so that they are able to alert us to any um, uh, spikes or extraordinarily um, unexpected trends that may um, have crossed their, crossed their service um, some of the things that they that we that they do get concerned with um, and have done in recent times are around those individuals that may approach them for uh, and have no recourse to public funds, for example. Um, and it's looking at um, problem solving with them around how we can assist with victims that may come forward that um, have, uh, you know, uh, quite complex needs. Um, and sometimes not very straightforward needs to to assist um, that are complex layers on top of the, the, the fact that they are victims of domestic abuse. Um, so working very, very closely with that open dialogue uh, with with Berkshire Women's Aid. And the third question, embarrassingly, I'm going to ask, unfortunately, to be repeated again because I the, my line has fallen out just at the end of that again. I'm very sorry. I think the question was um, in mentioning your report. The OPCC has recently commissioned a range of white services, including DAMER, DAWG. What was your finding in this group of? Can you, do you sorry, Councillor, do you mind just telling me what page that's on so I can have a look? Uh, oh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to stop now. I'm sorry, it's going to be difficult uh, to do the right thing. It's probably towards the end. I haven't got some of you. If you see, if you go back to the OPCC, recently commissioned a range of white services, a paragraph there. What page, Abdul? I'm finding it difficult to get the page right, to be honest. It's going to be towards the end of the report. Uh, so, 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 so. Is it page twenty? Yeah, I think it's under priority three. Yeah. Yes, thank you. You got it. Yeah. So in in the main uh, the ones i can talk about are um the the, the offenders the the, the um, projects that the opcc so the office of the police and crime commissioner has commissioned with respect to assisting offenders to break the cycle of offending so um with respect to for example domestic abuse there is very detailed perpetrator programs um long 
perpetrator programs that are over a number of weeks that um, are very detailed and very um, take a large amount of uh, commitment for offenders to be part of. Um, similarly, with uh, breaking the cycle of offending with the um, working in connection, com combination with um, the integrated offender management project, which looks at integrating offenders back into the community and um, integrating offenders back into the community and assisting them with uh, work and gaining skills to be able to break that cycle of offending. So they, those are just some of the projects that the Police and Crime Commissioner, I can, I'm also happy to get a more comprehensive list and circulate that round also. That would be great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Abdul. Uh, Oliver. Uh, Narinda, uh, the first question is um, one I probably ought to know the answer to, but I don't, and that is who is the councillor representative on the board? So the two councillor representatives on the board uh, are John Howshaw on the Community Safety Partnership and also councillor Lindsay Ferris. Lovely. Okay, thanks. Um, on the page 21, priority four, uh, talking about antisocial behaviour uh, primarily, and you said that uh, uh, some of this has gone down. Um, housing, antisocial behaviour surrounding houses is, is likely to be reported because it uh, affects individuals uh, in their homes. But antisocial behaviour in town centres is harder to report. Uh, and um, although it may be regarded as low, I think we also have to recognise that there are levels of expectation amongst the community uh, and this needs to be recognized and and the way, main way it's going to be picked up is by an increased presence of police in the town centers uh, which sadly we're not seeing at the moment what what is the uh, is is the the uh, board view on this and are they pressing the police to be more visible in the town centers Um, so in terms of antisocial behaviour in the towns, you're, you're, you're quite right. We do have um, hotspots in the towns in, t in, in terms of in antisocial behaviour. Um, uh, there is a town centre policing team and um, they they are as visible. Um, I'm told by police colleagues they are as visible uh, as is possible when they are on shift. Um, and. Um, we're, we're working in partnership with our police colleagues also to establish good partnerships, um, both with the businesses, um, retail businesses, and also with the um, licensed premises as well in terms of um, a, a pub watch, an active pub watch. So we're working in partnership with Thames Valley Police um, and the businesses to reinvigorate um, that element of the sort of town and encourage um, responsible conduct by the businesses so that uh, we have a reduction in antisocial behaviour and, and we're assisting and supporting those businesses where and where possible. Um, the, the other thing uh, that we're doing is really in terms of uh, antisocial behaviour is um, increasing the knowledge that the businesses and also people have in terms of who to report incidents to. Um, the, uh, we, uh, as a partnership, um, there was a gap in the antisocial behaviour um, officers post together with sort of the interim arrangements with myself, um, with, with myself and my post as the Community Safety Partnership Board. So um, that, that gap has now been filled in terms of the secondment from Thames Valley Police. Um, and really, we, we're now on a path to really increasing the, the engagement and increasing the information to, to local businesses and also to local residents of towns about who and where they can report incidents to. Thank you. That, that, of course, one of those channels is uh, the NAGs. And uh, uh, just for information, the uh, Norris and Westcott NAG is meeting tomorrow 
if you want to pass that on to the appropriate person. Yes, I will do that. Uh, helpful. Thank you. Um, my other question is about vehicle theft um, and them being shipped abroad. Now, uh, this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, I know about two years ago I raised this when one of the uh, the um, police commissioners came to talk, address the council. And it turned out then that uh, the main problem was that the lack of communication or delayed communication, should I say, between the local police and the border police. And uh, I would have hoped in the two years since then that this would have been improved, but it sounds as though it may not have been. And is this going to be addressed? Um, we, in terms of our uh, different communication with the border, I, 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 I did work um, on a large project in a, in a previous role with different uh, border force agency um partners and in terms of the information flowing to and fro from those agencies um it, it can often be quite sporadic um and and will be dependent upon resource so that is that is one area i believe that police colleagues are looking into in terms of um, joining up the approach on organized crime um and and with respect to the theft from these vehicles the theft of high performance vehicles, the, the sorts that we're seeing on on the locality, um, you know, this is very much in in tune with organised crime. These are not um, random and um, or opportunist type um, offences. This is part of a much, much larger and bigger picture um, on organised crime. So, um, yeah, I uh, the, to, to answer your question, the the information really flowing between those agencies um, does happen, um, and really, uh, I have to be honest, at, at sort of my level, I'm probably not party to to, to those partnerships and, and information because they are very much, um, you know, very covert and very sort of secretive uh, around some of the, the the operations and the information that can be um, gathered. But it is an intelligence by, uh, building picture. Um, so in terms of the the uh, um, in terms of the part that communities and the community safety partnership can play, um, certainly in terms of information to um, uh, colleagues and also in terms of preventative measures, those are the key things that we can do. Um, you know, if a vehicle is very very hard to uh, steal. Uh, you know that that the preventative end is is our best bet really in terms of fighting the fight against um, these organised criminals and uh, and making their life really really hard and um, making it clear that they're not well if they come to Wokingham they're not welcome. Yeah, that has to be the first approach. But uh, as an island, theoretically, we should be able to stop everything before it leaves the island. Theoretically. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Um, uh, having gone down the list uh, of everyone's names, does anyone have any further questions uh, since then? If so, can you please put your hand up now and I'll do them in uh, a similar order. Uh, so I'll go with Paul first. Thank you very much. A um, couple of points and, and a question. Um, Page 18, the domestic homicide reviews, there's been four cases since 2011. Did these uh, occur more recently or in the early years? I know you've got one currently ongoing and the lessons learned from those, have they, have they sort of worked or has there been issues with those? That's, that's my first one. Uh, the second one is on page 21, you talk about the NAGs and the town and parish councils. Um, it's only recently you've uh, made contact with Winners Parish Council, where I'm chairman. Um, certainly um, would welcome further uh, contact and you're welcome to come to any of our Zoom meetings. Uh, we have all of our meetings on, on Zoom these days. So or you could have a separate meeting with the parish clerk and myself if you wish. And on page 22, it says about the funding coming from the Police and Crime Commissioner. It says the same funding as for 2019-2020 as 2018-2019. Is that a typo? Thank you. 
I'll take these in reverse order. No, that's not a typo. That is correct. We've got maintained exactly the same funding levels as we did last year. The PCC has done that. Um, in terms of the DHR, we um, how often have they occurred since 2011? Roughly sporadically, I had a look at this um, when I came into post. So they we have roughly um, had um, a domestic homicide review being undertaken about every 18 months or so since then. So they've been quite spread out, but quite differing in in, in nature of, of um, the circumstances of what's occurred. Um, in terms of some of the recommendations and actions from those reports, um, I am currently undertaking a review um, in terms of having a look at all of those collectively to see, um, you know, where we've got um, uh, as part of um, coming into post recently, reviewing really where we've got with those actions and uh, whether they've worked or which ones we need to pick up and, and, and refresh and, and, and carry on, really. Um also, as part of that, we are also undertaking a borough-wide domestic um, abuse needs assessment, which is having a look at a really detailed piece of work around um, what, what, what the picture in the borough looks like. Um, and part of that is reviewing the outcomes of those domestic homicide reviews to see whether our actions have, have, have made um, what, what differences and impacts they have made. So that's sort of two ways of uh, making sure that we uh, have reviewed viewed those. Um, in terms of your invite to the NAGs, thank you very much. Um, I will um, ensure that that's passed on to localities colleagues who are leading on uh, the engagement with the NAGs. Um, but um, yeah, we, we, and, and, and I'm sure we will uh, very um, in, in the near future uh, be on uh, one of your Zoom meetings. Look forward to those. Okay, thank you. It's a parish council, not a NAG. Oh, <laughs> but thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, thanks, Paul. Keith. OK, thank you. Um, similar theme, NAGs. Uh, Woodley doesn't really have a NAG. There is a makings of one called Woodley and North Early NAG, um, but it basically is a floundering. Uh, residents are only interested when they have issues, when the issues have been resolved. They don't turn up. However, we do have a very thriving town centre management initiative, TCMI, which has been running for years. And historically, we always had police would come and present uh, the data of what's been going on in Woodley and uh, allow people to question them. And we have residents, we have charities, we have retailers, we have councillors, etc. We do have Jerry Cranford, who's the economic development officer, comes along. Um, so my my long rambling really is it would be great if we could get a localities person to come along to that. We meet about three times a year, that's all. And if you could do anything to encourage the police to re-engage, um, uh, would be most welcomely received. Thank you. I will, uh, I've made a note of that and I will pass that on to the new acting inspector for, for those councillors that aren't aware. Um, uh, we have an acting inspector in place at the moment, so I will definitely flag that with the acting expect, inspector in, in post at the moment. Okay, thank you. Clive. Thank you, Guy. Uh, pages uh, 40, 41, 42, 43 is, is all talking about uh, uh, drugs misuse. I d we all know of different hotspots uh, uh, around the borough, certainly uh, in early, lower early. Uh, there is sometimes quite a bit of, bit of activity in uh, uh, Maiden Place. I think there can be activity around some of our town centres, uh, possibly from time to time around secondary schools. And it must, must be known in secondary schools when uh, pupils are indulging in drugs because you can, you can smell it. Do you think that we're doing enough to confront this? 
within schools. And do you know what we actually do if a teacher raises concerns about a particular pupil? Firstly, um, in terms of doing enough, I mean, we uh, are reviewing our, um, together with public uh, health uh, colleagues, um, reviewing our offer across the schools in terms of uh, substance misuse and also the PSHE agenda, which covers the substance misuse issues off. Um, so that's being reviewed at the moment in terms of how we refresh and review that education and um, awareness uh, message that we're giving to to uh, young people. Um, I think in, in, in particular, it can be very, very difficult to um, deliver a, a credible message, um, depending on the way that the message is being delivered to, to uh, secondary school children. So we're having a look at that, really. Um, in terms of are we doing enough, I don't think we can ever do enough awareness and education around substance misuse because I think um, the more knowledge and information that we give uh, young people around this agenda, the more informed the choices are, together with um, giving more active and uh, more up-to-date and informed information to parents about the signs they should look out for and, and, and how and when they should be concerned about young people and um uh, drugs and substance misuse in particular um so so those are the those are the uh, around the sort of substance misuse and are we doing enough in terms of um the uh, what, what how teachers can can raise a concern they would do that very clearly through the safeguarding arrangements that we have in place for schools so the safeguarding policies make very clear arrangements and and pathways for how to talk and uh, and contact um the uh, Berkshire West Safeguarding Board um who can advise on any uh, practical or operational issues that the schools may have around it or uh, give any wider advice around a concern and if it's with respect to a particular individual people that they have then they can certainly evoke the safeguarding arrangements that are in place through the schools um, to contact our MASH hub so our multi-agency uh, referral hub that we have um, for children um, and uh, talk through those concerns with a professional about um, uh, um, uh, with respect to getting further information and advice. OK, because th there are probably two main reasons for children, uh, teenagers, youngsters getting getting into drugs. One is through school and through their social contacts and the other is through their family because their parents do it. Their parents see nothing wrong with it. And uh, uh, so the children growing up think that there is nothing wrong with it. What what can we do to get to those children who are not being given the best role models? Um, I, I think twofold, really. One is um, education and information and getting to them early. So so that that is really, really key in terms of giving us uh, uh, getting in early. Uh, you know, early and early intervention and prevention is is the key around substance misuse, um, and around uh, the whole of the crime and disorder agenda. If I'm honest, but um, especially with substance misuse and 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 health and learning behaviours around uh, th that sort of behaviour, um, but also. Um, the other thing we can do is trying to engage with young people on platforms that are uh, suitable to them. So, for example, is there, there is absolutely no point in us trying to engage with young people or, or our, it's, it's about knowing our target audience, really, and engaging with them in the appropriate fashion. So, um, you know, it, it, but depending on the audience, we would we, we should be using more social media and, and uh, electronic and virtual platforms um, as opposed to sort of, you know, put, written press or, or or so on and so forth so we need to get sharper and um we we need to get um really targeted in terms of the message that we're delivering and also making sure that those messages are being delivered by a credible source um you know young people young adults um are more likely to listen to messages from people that have done their been that um, instead of you know their parents giving them a message, or uh, actually, or or, te or or teachers maybe perhaps giving them a message as part of a classroom um, delivery. 
that's why sort of events like the um, knife crime event, which is uh, delivered peer on peer um, information for people that have been there and have lived experience of certain issues can deliver that message in a more credible form um, where it has more impact and more, um, yeah, more impact. Okay. Have you have you got the resources to try and engage with youngsters in the, in in the ways that you've just been describing? Um, within with within our team at the moment, um, the resources to be able to do that, unfortunately, no, um, not not as part as the wider at at the moment with the capacity that we have um unfortunately not no so we would do that though with um part we would do that in partnership with working um heavily relying on some of the engagement and some of the sort of agenda through children children young people's partnership um and also through it, the, the 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 um substance misuse work which is actually currently being held with strategy and commissioning at the moment um so um we we would rely on our on our partnership um response in, in terms of looking looking at that at the moment okay. okay this is a question for you then guy uh can we ask uh um, narinda to come back at uh one of our autumn meetings with with a plan of of the resources that she might need to do a better job to get children off this road to drugs. Well, considering we're doing the um, roadmap plan later on this evening, I have I have no objection to us putting that on an agenda item going forward. Uh, I think it's important. I think it's also important that even though we, the community safety partnership we see once a year, it would be. I think it. I personally think it might be good to see what's going on and how things have changed in what the period that we've just had, because all of our previous data is going out has been thrown out the window. We've basically got a a, a new normal in working from home. I feel that that's also going to have an impact on things. So I think it is. it would be important to try if you've got the resource, Narinda, to get us basically a half-year update of some of the things that have been raised tonight and also some of the data, if you can get it. That's what I'm thinking at the moment. Yeah, I can take that request away. Okay, thanks. Does anyone have anything else for Narinda? Okay, Narinda, I think it's a, I think that's a, you have some actions to take away, but thank you very much. I thought that was very useful. Um, there's certainly a lot of, lot of things to do and say. Is there anything you have, you want to add at all before we move on to the next item? No, just thank you very much. No worries, thank you. So, uh, moving on to the next agenda. So, if you want to head off, Narinda, um, I, are you required for the next one? I'm not. And if you don't mind, that'd be brilliant. Thank you. If I head <laughs> off. No. Uh, Thank you, go ahead, go, ahead, go ahead. Thank you, Thank very you much. Narinda. So, uh, moving on to agenda item number 11, which is the burial plot capacity update. Uh, I believe that is you taking this, Nigel, unless I'm very much mistaken. It is indeed, yes. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Um, thanks, Guy. Um, this was a report, a sort of a follow up report to the report I brought you in January, and it was due to come to you in March, obviously, before the pandemic hit. Uh, rather than update, update the full report, you'll see on page 57 there is sort of a bullet point update of the work that's been carried out since. Um, clearly, obviously, burial capacity has been one of the key key areas we've been looking at um, as part of our um, response to, to the pandemic. Um, and I chair the local death process management group within the council, and that links into the wider Berkshire and Thames Valley groups and through into the, the Gold group within the council. Um, if you remember from the previous, previous report, we talked about around about 340 um, full burial plots available across, across the borough. 
and we had that sort of confirmed around the sort of the, the early early April uh, across all cemeteries within the borough and about a thousand cremation plots as well available. Um, obviously the the um, estimates of um, COVID related deaths and excess deaths has sort of changed significantly over the, the life of the pandemic um, and at the moment the latest is around 35 to 40 per week um, excess deaths um, through to the end of June obviously again that will start tailing off further um, although from from the point of view of the burial plots obviously not everybody who dies will be looking for a burial plot and the majority are, um, are cremated so we're looking around 20 percent which is around eight plots a week um, burial plots a week I would say however we haven't seen that demand coming through at all so far through our through our, 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 uh, um, our cemeteries and from anecdotal evidence from the other cemeteries across the borough they haven't seen that either which may be because of um, restrictions on attendance. It may be because people are just moving through straight to cremation. What we've actually been, been monitoring as well as that is just monitoring through the um, death process management groups um, across Berkshire is ensuring we've got capacity both in, in mortuary capacity, but also in, in cemetery capacity, cremation capacity, um, funeral directors, grave digging, all the various different areas, all of which at the moment are fine are green and that's continued to be monitored on a, on a weekly and, and, and a fortnightly basis by the wider group. However, within Wokingham, although, although looking at the figures we have sufficient, we're very conscious of a potential second spike and so want to ensure that we have sufficient um, burial plots available going forward. We were already looking at a, at a potential purchase of land in Ruscombe, however unfortunately because of ground conditions that was considered not suitable. So we're looking again now at sort of expanding um, and providing more plots within San Sebastian Cemetery, which has the potential to provide around about 250 to 300 plots initially, but potentially further if we do some, um, some work around the actual access access range, reconfiguring the entrance road. That's now um, being looked at. We've had a couple of quotes in. We're just looking through those quotes to understand from health and safety perspective and the cost perspective as well, and we've moved that forward. What we have done in the interim period is to make some changes to Shinfield Cemetery to provide about 50 or 60 additional um, Muslim burial plots um, and also working with Mays Lane with um, the early town council to provide some advice and support around their plans to extend as well. So with all those coming forward um, and provided we can move forward with the extension to St Sebastian's and certainly feel going certainly for the next the next few years we have sufficient capacity uh, within the burial plots. But we will continue to monitor that and as it said in the in the report carry out a, a further review of the overall capacity in the autumn or early winter um later this year and that's it if anyone's got any questions okay thank you for that nigel we'll go in reverse order tonight uh this time so oliver um thank you for that nigel um obviously or presumably the autumn review will then be uh, brought back to us. Um, but also there's mention in the report of the um, possibility of a uh, borough council crematorium. Um, could you include what progress or what the intentions are uh, for that uh, in, in that report when you come back at the end of the year, please? Yes, certainly. Hopefully we'll have the, the progressed a bit further on that. We'll be able to give you more information on that. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. Uh, Abdul. Abdul, you're still muted. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah? Ask question yep. proposal not happening for further 172 burial. Can we look into different areas of the borough for the Muslim burial? For example, as you mentioned in your report, in working on without. Thank you. Um, we certainly can. Uh, thanks for that. Um, certainly, when and if we get the additional 250 to 300 um, extra capacity, if we achieve that within San Sebastian's, we would certainly be looking to identify a particular area of that for, for Muslim burial, specifically for Muslim burial plots there. And then we would have some there, some in the Shinfield and some in Mays Lane as well, so spread fairly much throughout the borough. Any idea uh, how many in Mays Lane? You've got 50 and 60 in Shinfield. Um, Maze Lane, Maze Lane, and actually probably um, Clive may be able to help, help you a bit more on that. The Maze Lane proposals are fairly early days, but my understanding is that could potentially provide another 400 
plots generally, of which I'm aware that they are looking to provide an additional number of, of Muslim burials. At the moment, my understanding again from what when I went out and inspected it, there's certainly room for about, about another 20 or 30 on Mays Lane at the moment, but they'd be looking to extend that further when they have their own extension to the cemetery. In my understanding, in the past, it used to be only for children, but now adults can also bury there, yeah? Yeah, that's my understanding as well, but it, it's it's not something we manage, my understanding from, from talking to, to to early town council, yes. Uh, I, I'm glad we can hear that, I'm glad it's here, so thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, just quickly then, Clive, did you have anything to add further to that as, as it was direct to you as well? Uh, yeah, I, th I think it is about right that it's uh, 400 uh, uh, in the extension and uh, there is going to be part of the extension set aside for uh, Muslim burials and, and uh, uh, for children and babies as well. It's you next, Clive, as well, so that worked really well. Okay. Unless you got right. anything else, Abdul? No, thank you. Okay, okay thanks. Yeah, I think I think the capacity generally in Mays Lane, we thought that we were going to run out within two years, but uh, uh, with the changes that uh, that we've seen over the last couple of months, where there have been less burials and uh, uh, more more cremations, we might not run out in in uh, 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 two years, but we will still go ahead with the extension uh, uh, this year. But can can I ask Nigel, uh, what's happening with the idea of a crematorium? Have you identified a site somewhere within the borough? I can't remember if this question was asked at a previous uh, overview and scrutiny or, or, not, or, or not, I'm afraid. And will it have any burial space or will there just be space for the burial of ashes? Um, there's no final decision on, on any particular site at the moment. I think my understanding is there's reports going through the Asset Review Board over the next, the next few weeks with proposals and that obviously can, can feed that back in through the process, councillors. Um, in terms of the provision within there, again, no final decision has been made. I think we're looking, obviously, at a, at a green crematorium to give us our, our USP, um, which obviously potentially has opportunities for woodland burials as well. And so that's obviously one of the growing trends, that's the right word, in, in burials. And I think we're certainly looking to pick that up. Um, and from my perspective, I would expect there to be a proportion of that site being identified for full burial plots as well. Okay, is there is there an indication that uh, East Hampstead and and Reading are actually at at capacity? Not at the moment, no, not that I'm aware. No, certainly not. That's not the message we're getting from all the the, the weekly briefings from both the red colleagues in Reading and Bracknell. No, so if it, if they're not at capacity, and we have had a uh, an increase in deaths over this time last year. Do, do we actually need to be going ahead with our own crematorium? Well, I think that's part of what we'll, what we'll be looking at in the light of COVID, in the light of what's happened over the last the last few months when we put forward the proposals. Um, we'll have to review again that's, you know, the the need for it and, you know, the, the risk in terms of taking it forward. Um, I'm certainly aware that the Bracknell, you know, open, I think opened a second, a second chapel, which hasn't been used as much as they expected. Um, and so it's something we would certainly look at before we went ahead. And I think in terms of any report back through the um, councillor process and the and approval process would need to be very clear on, on that and the risks involved. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Guy. Uh, no worries. Graham. Uh, the questions I had were about capacity and uh, they've been answered, so I'm OK. Thank you. Okay, I guess it's actually going to me now then. Um, so, oh, so in regards to the, my question is in, in regards to the 
the the the fact that tw- previously twenty percent of burials were sorry twenty percent of deaths were burials. What's the number dropped down to then re- um, recently with what's been going on? I have to admit I can't I can't tell you that guy. I'm not I'm okay. not that close to it. I'm afraid. And That's no worries. We certainly in terms of numbers coming through, we've been sort of within our cemeteries total we've been doing two or three a week across all our cemeteries which is significantly lower than the sort of the the eight now whether that's because of actual numbers coming through or or it's demand we're not quite sure but it's dropped significantly from where we were okay that's interesting um right and in regard and in regards to the land at ruskam i presume that was due to the water table or something like that that's correct yeah yeah right yeah, that's, uh, that, which is the problem with the great parts of the borough because we are basically between about three major rivers. Um, okay, that's it for my questions. Um, as the other elements were covered off, so we go to Paul. Thank you. Uh, three of my questions have already been asked, so I've got one remaining, which is the circa 340 full burial plots subject to ground conditions permitting, when will we know what the actual numbers are following survey work? Um, we're not surveying it. What the, the issue we've got is that, that some of the burial plots are usable during the summer and some are not usable during the winter because of ground conditions and groundwater. Um, and so they will vary from, from season to season. Um, and I think what we're trying to make sure, certainly in the San Sebastian's one, is that they're more more all year round. But certainly some of the Shinfield ones are not potentially not usable during during. And certainly this winter, certain areas of the Shinfield um, cemetery haven't been usable. But there's a sufficient. It's about half and half at the moment. Sufficient is, is usable during the win during the during the win. So it really depends on the climate conditions because we had a very wet winter or autumn and winter, hence why they couldn't be used this year. Yes, but if but you I get think... drier, a drier winter or a drier season, then there is the potential to still use them. I mean, it's, yeah, I, having learned a lot about this over the last few months, um, not, um, I think, you know, we certainly, in terms of looking to how we allocate graves during the season is quite important to us now, which we probably hadn't realised that before. OK, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Shirley? Hello, yes. Um, just a quick question. You briefly, uh, thank you for the report, Nigel. Um, you briefly touched on uh, woodland burials as being a, 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 a kind of an up and coming thing. And I think you're right. I've, I've been to one or two woodland burials and um, yeah, quite a pleasant experience if a, if a funeral can be pleasant. Um, it occurs to me that one of the, it, this would almost kind of help with our climate emergency um, uh, uh, plan in terms of tree planting um, uh, as well, because uh, certainly I know that you, you start with an open space and then you 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 have the burial and then some trees are planted on, on or near the grave, and then eventually you create a woodland. Um, have you got any um, sort of areas kind of earmarked or that you're well, looking at for yeah. that purpose? One of the things we were looking at in, in terms of why we're sort of looking at a variety of different. Um, locations for the crematorium was potentially as exactly as you said today, to put it adjacent to an area where we actually want to start um, use some of that that that's tree planting across the borough. We combine the two so it becomes a, sort of you know, it, one flows into the other and it, as it grows we can sort of develop out a wider area that includes potentially some you know some public space as well and the crematorium is more of a the place to visit and the contemplation and everything else which may include some woodland area as well so I think you're right to try and Put the two next to each other so we try and combine the two um again more work to be done how that may work but you're right it's it, it, it's certainly something that's that you know i think people are interested in and certainly in the current climate i think we're, we're going to see more and more as we move forward on that yes right thank you thank you for that uh, keith being at the end of the chain all my questions have been answered that's what I like to hear, Keith. And, that, and that's the reason why I, Callum was definitely right, keep reversing the order each time. Um, I, I think the, I think, Nigel, thanks very much for doing this. I think there's, there's going to be some work needing to be done. I think the, from the questions that have been asked, I think the committee would like you to, to see you back 
at the end of the autumn, so maybe a November, December meeting um, to go through this in, in and see where we are from there. But it certainly is not painting as, um, especially considering the circumstances that we've had, it's definitely not as concerning as we saw back in January. So some good work has been done here. Okay, thanks. Is there anything you want to add further uh, before we move on and you can uh, uh, go and uh, go uh, relax with the rest of your evening? Yeah, that's fine, thanks. Does anyone else have anything on this? Okay, uh, right. Thank you very much, Nigel. Cheers. So we will move on. Have a very good evening. Uh, Thank you, Nigel. We, we can now move on to the, the final agenda item this evening, which is item number 12. Uh, which is actually looking at uh, the work program. Now, we've got the annex um, currently before us, um, which I presume everyone can see. Now, I'm going to look to Callum here for a few questions. Effectively, I presume that the first opportunity we would have to review the budget would be a post September meeting in October or at least the end of September because I because if I'm recalling from last year that was basically what we did it was it was around the plans and strategies from Graham about the budget uh, Neil I can see your hand up so go ahead thanks guy just a quick point that the management committee is meeting on Wednesday Yep. to consider all the work programmes and they're also receiving a report from the chief executive on COVID-19 and the council's response. Okay. Uh, in, in response to that, the suggestion is that each of the scrutiny committees have a close look at some aspects of the council's response and then we pull it all together into a composite report back to executive in the autumn, which hopefully will raise some, some lessons learned and some ideas for improvement, just in case we have a repeat in the winter so that's so the what discussion on wednesday so what time scales is being um considered for that report so i presume that because uh, if it's being considered for the autumn we would have to have another meeting before september in that in that case to actually look through at some of the stuff um in this in this regard because right now i'm looking at the dates of the future meetings and it, we've got four in the diary currently which is sep I know I missed an emergency meeting, as it were, uh, but it's September 2nd, November 23rd, 6th of Jan, and 29th of March. And if we're supposed to be reporting back in the autumn, it's a bit late to look at this in September, I think. I think it depends on your appetite for scrutiny. So you might want to <laughs> arrange some extra meetings. But this is, I think, a really important piece of work, and it'd it would be really good it if is. we could all come together with some really good ideas to help the council moving forwards. So extra meetings may be necessary if you think that's suitable. I, I think in looking at this, it would be suitable. Uh, I don't know the opinion of the rest of the uh, um, of the rest of the meeting. Um, uh, Keith, I can see your hands up. And so is Clive's now. Keith, go ahead. Yeah, um, well, I sat through these sorts of things many, many times over the, my period on being in the council. The first thing I want to say is... Um, the 16 items to be considered, plus the one that's just now been added, is a joke. There is absolutely no way you can cover, particularly when some of them are so broad, like review highways and transport issues, including everything that highways and transport does. You're never going to be able to do that. Um, I think, to me, we need to effectively scrap all that stuff interesting as they are and be much much more focused because you're not going to get decent scrutiny by having such a long list and the focus i would say is one the budget and two the uh covid19 and i think we shouldn't be trying to have extra meetings to cram that in they should be the priority i would also like to add one other to be considered is um, it's very topical. Um, we have a BAME forum, which has been going for what, 
18, 20 years. And I have searched, and I've known about it for a long time, but I've searched for any uh, reference to it, any uh, committee minutes or anything, um, and I can't find anything. And in the light of the current climate, I think if we actually looked at some, what I think is a very important forum, it should be, but I think we ought to look at that to see how that can also be improved. So for me, that's the only three things I would touch. So in effect, get a report from the uh, the BAME forum. Uh, Abdul, I know that you sit on this, or at least you have sat on this. Can I come to you then quickly? Yes. Um, I do sit on it. Um, going back to his answer to his question, we have got um, all the minutes with an officer called Ashwani Gupta. He's the um, officer in working about council. So it is possible to go back all these years and go back to every um, agenda items and minutes which have been recorded. Did you hear me? Thanks. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I am having trouble um, hearing with, with Abdul. Notwithstanding the minutes or whatever, I certainly think um, uh, it would be worthwhile to see what, you know, how successful are they, what sort of things are getting in their way of being successful, if they're not, how can we improve it, what, what gates do we need to open for them, what blocks do we need to remove, because I think as we go forward, it's, and, and it's going to be a very, very key component in this whole um, current climate, because I think this this current work is going to be there for probably 18 months or even longer. Um, and I just think we ought to look at, bear in mind, you know, we are a community overview and scrutiny. And what is a community? It's it's everyone, including BAME. Absolutely right, Keith. Uh, I am more than happy to speak to the chair and he can come to our scrutiny or you are welcome to sit in the next um, meeting when we have. I think it, I think inviting the chair along to a meeting would be a very good one. Um, so I think uh, does anyone have any uh, any objections on that um, in regards to inviting the uh, chair of the uh, BAME committee to basically come and have effectively, for the lack of better description, a round table uh, with us to basically find out what what they want what they what we can do to basically make things easier etc cetera, etc cetera, and just have a frank discussion does anyone have any objections to that um great uh Cl clive's first and then i'll go to graham i just wanted to say something about this list of 16 <laughs> items <laughs> i think keith um, might have got there as well yeah, well, I'm, uh, I'm afraid I disagree with uh, Keith, who says that we should just be looking at the budget, COVID-19 and BAME. I think a lot of these other items are, well, I think they are all important to look at, and not all of them are going to take an hour of scrutiny or some of them 40 minutes of scrutiny, maybe maybe 30 minutes. And quite a few of the scrutiny meetings over the last two or three years, we have had one major project to be looking at at that meeting and a couple of smaller ones. And I think we can still get through an awful lot of these. I think housing services and what the local need is, I think is is still very important. Council owned owned companies, particularly the uh, joint venture with uh, Optilus and our relationship with the Royal Borough of Windsor, Windsor and Maidenhead are, who are in you know real financial problems and uh, obviously COVID-19 and obviously the budget. But uh, I think that we can still look at most of these over the next uh, 12, 12 to 18 months. Some of them you could push back going to 18 months, but uh, I think a lot of them we can still look at. Uh, just quickly, Neil, as I see your hands up. As I assume it's a te 
It's a general question. I don't, I don't think I've taken it down. That's probably the issue. That will uh, confuse me. Just, okay. just, just a quick comment, though. As Keith, as Keith is aware, we are now running uh, task and finish groups successfully. So if members have a particular interest in one of these items, there's no reason why we couldn't do things outside the committee. So there is flexibility in the process. It's not all about the committee meeting. It could be done other ways. I'm almost tempted um, to throw Paul and Keith into a task and finish group uh, reviewing highways and transport issues. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> or is that just me being cruel? <laughs> I'd like to be a fly on the wall. <laughs> uh, OK, sorry. Um, but that, but yes, Neil, you, you do make a very good point uh, on, on on that. Uh, Graham, do you want to add, add anything quickly? As I didn't uh, go, went, need to go to you next. Well, your, your, your wit, Chairman, is still alive at this late hour, which is good. Um, I'm sort of halfway between Keith and uh, uh, Clive, um, because what I'm seeing is a list of stuff. What I'm not seeing is a list of priorities. And if the 16 were prioritised, then perhaps we, with our scheduling, I don't know whether some stuff takes four minutes or four hours. It doesn't matter. But uh, if we could look at it with time allocation and uh, priority of importance, then we might draw a line under either item four or item 12. It doesn't matter. But uh, I think that we ought to approach it that way. Otherwise, we're just burdening ourselves with a load of stuff, which, frankly, could end up being non-productive. And I, I, I dislike being non-productive. I think you, I think you've hit the nail on the head there as well, Graham. Because uh, I mean, the two e areas that we covered tonight were very important. The burial one was a lot quicker than we were previously anticipating, so that's good. So that's an example about where we can do something quickly. Um, so yeah, doing it in terms of priority, but Keith is, I think in terms of the three big things that we need to look at in the in the short to medium term, so the next six months as it were, the budget COVID-19 and the BAME agenda do feel to be the big ones. Other projects are behind that so basically are backing up and supporting them is a different question. Like we all bet the next burial update will be tacked on to something like in November, December time. Um, so yeah. Uh, Paul, and then I'll go back to you, Keith and Abdul. Is your hand still up as well? Uh, no, I'm up there at the moment. Okay, I'll take it down. Yeah, thank, thank you, Guy. Um, I was going to go along the same lines as what Graham has just said and Clive. I think we should look at all of these 16 uh, particular topics and put them into a priority order. Some may fall into next financial uh, next municipal year, which isn't an issue in some cases because they can wait. And we can also look at uh, particular topics being looked at by task and finish groups. And then that work can then be done and then just reported back. But if Keith and I are thrown into the same room, could I have uh, a mediator in between, please? Thank you. So that's going to have to be me, isn't it? <laughs> Only joking, Keith, of course. <laughs> uh, Keith, do you want to come back on that at all? <laughs> and in the blue corner, Mr Baker. <laughs> uh, actually, Paul, Paul, you and I probably, you'd be amazed how we would be on the same pages. Absolutely. Uh, uh, let me just... I, I, think, I think we would in most cases, Keith. Yeah. I was only joking. <laughs> I know. I was being serious. Um, you know, to me... Everything's important, right? All these things are important. I'm not saying they're not important, but I'm trying to get some practicalities in here, right? Clive said at least 30 minutes. Well, you do the sums, that means you have to have a minimum of 30 minutes on at least two of these big items every single meeting. Or we double, we have eight meetings, we have a meeting every month, okay? That's the practicality of it, you know? Look, I'll pick up highways. The number 10, there's no way, based on what that says, you can cover that in 30 minutes. You're going to need at least two, maybe three um, uh, meetings dedicated to that, 30 minutes to half an hour. If you just pick one topic, for instance, which is close to all our um, 
our minds at the moment is highways maintenance. You know, we changed the system and we're doing this tar and chip and tar thing and it's not going down very well for whatever reason. If we just start concentrated on road maintenance, how do they choose the roads? Why do they choose the technology, etc., on the roads? That's going to take more than 30 minutes. So it's a practicality thing. You know, we could reduce some of them by focusing something that's key within the broad. You know, again, I use eyes in transport uh, as an uh, uh, as an example. Something focused in there. Yes, we can have task and finish groups. I'm on one myself uh, for climate emergency. The issue there is, you know. Uh, although I'm retired, a lot of people work. And if you look, if you ask any of our leaders, you know, uh, Lindsay, for instance, or, or John, the difficulty in getting people to free up some time to go on another, yet another committee is extremely difficult. So it's all what I'm coming from is a practicality point of view. Task and finish groups work great as long as you can get the people who are the right people to go on them. I'll go off my hobby horse now. <laughs> no, it's, it, it's fair. I think we're, we're all roughly on the same uh, page, as it were, in, in terms of what we're trying to do. Uh, I think, yeah, we do. I think we need to focus on uh, narrowing down the scope of some of these um, that's for certain. I mean, I mean, let's ju let's just go down. Let's just go down one by one um, in this. So, effectively, you've got item one, which is the, the budget development, which that's going to take multiple meetings. So we know that that's going to go ahead throughout multiple meetings in the autumn. The community safety partnership, that's next March. Again, other than the update that we've asked for in the autumn. From earlier in the meeting so that's another item that we can that we will need to look into the flood risk management and responsibilities and monitoring of flood risk activities is that something that needs to, that is we need to is that something that is a is is higher on the priority or is it lower on the priority what's the committee's thinking on that asset review it, 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 it is we need to put this in in terms of priority is there any is there so i'll open it up to everyone is there anything outside of the budget and covid-19 and in my opinion the bame agenda with what's happened uh in the us recently that is top of mind that everyone wants to i want to see this come to the committee as it were Clive? Uh, item 14, Guy, which is uh, housing services. Yep. And a council owned company. I wrote this down earlier, but I can't find it now. Oh, there it is, 15. 15. And uh, uh, civil parking enforcement, I don't think we need to look at that again for. Another 12 I, I, I think civil parking enforcement, considering it was effectively put very much down the road, the, the priority list in what happened recently, we can probably hold that off until the next calendar year is my gut feeling on that. Yeah. And uh, a review of Copied Beach. I don't think that that would take very long if it if indeed it does need to be looked at uh, again. But uh, scrutinising the council's emerging arts and culture strategy, I think we do need to be looking at that because that is something that is new that's coming to the council, isn't it? So my thinking on that one personally was that should be something that's rolled into the budget. Um, Keith, do you want to jump in on this as well? Um, so basically what Clive's saying is all of them. No, oh, no. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Clive. But I, haven't said that. I, I would like to add something that's that is current and new, which is it's it's a subset of 10, the highways. I would like yep. us to scrutinize the whole issue of road repairs. 
not just the maintenance, but the whole concept of how they select roads to be um, to have attention. How do they select what attention it is, whether it's a full resurfacing? What are the blocks? You know, if you look at social media, you know, the number of people who are complaining about the roads, their roads are not being fixed. Some people actually say based on the new um, chip and tar system, they're pleased that they're not on the list. You know, there's lots of complaints about the chip and tar system, etc. You know, it's a hot topic of our residents. And I, I would guess most councillors, apart from Paul, um, don't actually understand how that works. Is there any bias there? Does one group get more than the other? I don't know. So that's quite a tight focus one, which could be done, say, in 30 minutes. And I think that would also actually cover off a, a decent chunk of the the highway and transport issue, because right now it is a, a hot topic, as you say. Um, so I'd be will I'd be willing to I'd say if we put that on the as an item agenda for especially for September um, uh, in in that regard at the uh, at the earliest unless we basically try and get in another meeting when we're looking at the COVID stuff as well um, but 14 of 15 yeah I agree with we should look at that and these those are ones that are areas that can basically be tacked on after some of the budget meetings as well because they do slide in quite well like yep. the housing social the housing services one for example would be a very good one to slot in after children and adult services have done their piece on the budget aspect as an example and and despite what Keith just said I did say that 12 and 13 could be uh, a little bit later <laughs> didn't have to be now Paul I, I agree with uh, Keith that number 10 is a too wide a topic to, to be covered in one particular foul swoop and it should be broken down. I'm quite happy to look at highway maintenance in, in the whole concept. Um, things like car parking and, and uh, maybe the customer service side, that could possibly be delayed for the time being. Uh, together with maybe the highway contracts because things have changed a little bit because of COVID-19. So there's a priority on what we look at. And the maintenance side, I agree that that needs to come in September because we'll be looking at next year's programme. And that's what yeah. we need to understand. Uh, Shirley, I've just realised you've been you've had your hand up and I've not noticed it. I agree with you, though, Paul. Oh, oh that's OK. Don't worry. I was listening to everything else. Um, in that same section, the, the highways uh, section, uh, the reviewing there also has its bus strategy and cycling infrastructure. Um, and those are those are issues, I think, that are going to become more to the fore um, with, with the, uh, the climate, uh, the climate emergency um, activities and the fact that cycling has is being very much encouraged due to COVID-19. Um, and I wonder whether that might be something that would could be suited, suitable for a, a task and finish group and, and taken out of that highways issue as a separate as a separate item, perhaps. That's not a bad idea at all. Uh, the question is, it, the question is timing in regards to that, because I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, is that also something that we could effectively tag on to um, again, one of the budget meetings, perhaps when climate emergency section and, and environments on effectively as well uh, and this is the problem with tra with highways and transport it just expands and keeps going doesn't it okay let's, let's put a bit of focus here because we want what we want to try and do is effectively get a an agenda for at least the next two meetings uh, and we can move on there but I do agree I think you're right Shirley in regards to public and green transport um, so I'm conscious it is 11, it is 11, it is 21-11. Sorry, yeah. I just ahead. wanted to say one other very quick thing as well, is you, you're talking about the, the next meeting being in September. Well, bearing in uh, mind, none of us are going to be gadding off on uh, exciting holidays in August. Maybe maybe a, an additional meeting could be slotted in August. Uh, that may be a bit controversial. Yeah, I, 
<laughs> I, I don't just uh, well i'm known for mr extraordinary meeting aren't I? um but i i think we need to have another meeting because we've i i would say effectively the either the beginning of august or the end of the last week of july um certainly not the full the last full calendar week of july unless you want me basically appearing as a slightly crazy wild-haired man because of the end of my fiscal year at work um but I mean, Callum, is, is do we do we have the capacity to effectively put a meeting in on say the twenty seventh of July or the third of August or something? As well, I've booked a week on the Isle of Wight, so if needed, I can ring in from the Isle of Wight in September. Yep, there's. Uh, I I don't see too much of an issue. Let me just quickly check the calendar. Um, but no, uh, I mean we can have meetings as uh, as needed. So that that last week of July would would make sense um in terms of the the task and finish group i mean there's there's capacity for that as well if if um three uh, or so members from this committee were interested in um the uh, talking to some officers um and looking at best uh, practice sort of across the country about bus strategy and cycling infrastructure um we could because also organize what... that in the background yeah i think that might be a good idea to organize that in the background um uh, because one aspect that it would be useful on the uh on that point to look at is also effectively what we're referring to at work as the new normal which is what we're doing here now uh with more home working more remote working etc 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 and the impact that that has on the transport network and buses and cycling etc as well so there's, there's there's a lot of aspects to consider on that um so i think on the task and finish group it will be a case of emails going around and asking who would, who wants to sit on it. I, I presume that you'd be interested to sit on it, Shirley. And I, I, do I then need to fight off Keith and Paul? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'd be more than happy to. Okay. I mean, is, so is, is there is there a uh, interest to? We don't need to formalise the the membership necessarily now, but it would need to be sort of a, a just a general consensus of the committee to set to set that task and finish group up because it would be a task and finish group of the committee. Um, but is there a general public consensus? And, for public and green transport, I think it's worthwhile looking at so we can get a uh, a more in-depth report working with it personally. Um, is uh, our members in favour of that? Right, Just I'm say yes. Take yes. <laughs> <laughs> yourself off mute and say yes or no. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. 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 Okay, I'll send a, an, an email around um, asking to see sort of who wants to be on it and we'll look sort of We'll try and keep it small and focused. Three members would probably be ideal, but if five members, for example, or even four, if um, wanted to to go on it, we can we can move that. But if we could try to keep it focused, that would just make things um, easier. Looking at the 27th of July, um, that is clear at the moment. It looks like if we wanted to have a meeting to look at um, the, the the initial steps of sort of the the, the community response to COVID and the budgetary impacts of that. Yeah, um, I think that would be a good idea because looking at the community response to COVID is good. So we've got the, I mean, areas. I mean, let's just let's just write let's just step, write a list on this of community aspects. We basically had the community hub, we had the council's effectively staff redeployment, we had uh, effectively the charity response, we ha have had business response. I mean, I spent effectively every friday for nine weeks working an eight-hour shift in a 3d mask printing fa fa factory at work um so that's the those are aspects that we can look into just as a starter and how but we we need to be able to focus it and effectively look at it from what we what how community groups and the council have worked together effectively because that's bringing the community and the corporate element together. Shirley, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this hand raising thing. Um, and that I think that is the other aspect. Effectively, is the uh, is the BAME agenda for a July meeting. I mean, uh, Abdul, is that would that be possible for? Effectively a month's time. Or will we need more time, do you think? Sorry? 
It's different than what this is, and I'm not sure, to be honest. If you can make some inquiries, uh, and if not, we'll have to push that element to September then. Um, and the for September, I also think that it would be a good one to do the uh, key suggestion on the road maintenance, because that gives officers plenty of time to get it prepared. And also it looks at next year's program. So I put that in as September. Uh, I'd also, and for potentially for the July meeting, um, it might be, it, I think it might be worthwhile looking at item 14 of the housing services for needs and local residents, because that would be an aspect that we could look at in regards to how they've responded to COVID-19 as well, um, to fill out the 27th a bit. Clive, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, yes, I think we should be looking at the council's property uh, investment fund. Uh, I know that we will look at it, I'm sure, during our budget meetings, but I think the government is also uh, at the moment doing a review of this as well. So I think that sometime in either September or November, we should be looking at it very carefully as well. And I, I it was is a big part of the council's um, budget program. Yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking effectively, either set, either the first meeting of September, or effectively putting that in with the budget. So effectively getting Graham along to talk about the initial budget process at the end of September, and then attaching this as well. That was my gut feeling because I thought that that. I think that ties up quite nicely, personally. That'd be, that's okay. Fine with that. Um, Sorry, Guy, when you say so, the end of September, were you suggesting having an additional meeting at the end of September? Yeah, we, we're not going to be able to do the entire we budget. Go. in. <laughs> we're so, not going to be able to do the budget in sept on, the, on the 2nd of September and the 23rd of November on its own. No, 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 I, it's I, too I agree. Big. My suggestion would be um, that I go and look at what we had last year in terms of yeah. meeting dates yeah. and I'll go to um, to John and to Graham and I'll um, suggest sort of similar-ish dates and then hopefully Agreed. we can agree and then I'll email all members and just sort of give them an update. Yeah, that's uh, I agree because the, the, the amount I think we had just about the right amount last year. We may need more, we may need less, who knows. So just, just to clarify, um, I've got for the July meeting um so we're going to look at the covid response um sort of the community response including community hub staff redeployment business response charity response um i'll liaise with abdul in terms of the um uh, bame uh forum seeing if we can get the chair along just to have a a, a, a sort of a, a general chat and sort of see what the council can do um i think that fills out july quite well the ordinary meeting in september I've got the road repairs. I imagine there may be a follow-up COVID. I can't imagine that all of the COVID things will have been finished by in that one July meeting. I would have thought Agreed. that might need to be a follow-up. There'll be questions that the committee asked that officers have to come back in September. So, I mean, in, in terms of workload, September meeting, having the road repairs and COVID, that, that may well be enough unless we wanted a third item particularly in there. I think that would be enough at the moment off the top of my head. I mean, we can look at it again in uh, a month's time um, at the end of the other at the end of the July meeting, as it were. And then the one at the end of September, we've got the, the initial budget chat and um, council uh, investment portfolio. Is that correct? Yes, that's what I think would be a good match up on that regard. OK, I've got that all down unless there are any other suggestions. And and uh, and of course, emailing out about the top, about a task and finish group on public and green transport. Yep. Is is everyone? I can see your hand still up, Clive. Is that is that on purpose or? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Are we going to are we going to look at housing services? Are we going to look at the performance of council and companies? Oh, housing services was. I suggested that for July, didn't I? 
Um, how's it? Oh yes, I got that there. Um, so do we want that sort of as I a? I... Uh, do you, do you want them to sort of include their update within the COVID? Res- it sort of in the frame of a COVID a response. Good, I, I think it would be a good one to start within the frame of the COVID response because the the challenges that they have is probably going to be slightly different. Hmm. Uh, I mean, one thing that springs to mind within housing services with our um, our social housing stock. Is if is any maintenance requests that have had to come in in this period has been a, uh, I don't know how those processes have been done. So that would be a nice that would be an interesting thing to know, because the most important thing is how we've taken care of some of our most vulnerable residents, and yeah. that is where an aspect we should actually look at. So it's basically trying to tie both the COVID response but also the social uh, the. Uh, the housing services element to get together as well so trying to look at it from that point of view yep that's fine i'll make contact with housing services and get them to incorporate an update within the sort of greater covid community response neil so just on that point guy the chief executive's report on wednesday does present some information about the way that housing have responded as part of the overall covid response so it is a good fit as you've identified okay that's that's then perfect man so uh yeah i think i think we've i think we've got a plan for the at least the first two two and a half meetings there uh does any is is the is the committee satisfied with that i know this is a bit more a roundabout way of what how we previously do it but we are not in a normal meeting room having a conversation it makes sense how about uh, council owned companies then um, I think we'd have right. to look at that in, in one of the later September to October meetings okay or or even 23rd of November just yeah, yeah. oh yeah yeah but we've got Oops. plenty of time to, to, we've got yeah. plenty of time till there, to there Clive I'm, I'm trying to get the, I'm trying to get the first two okay properly done and then it's more flexible as you're going on yeah okay but yeah I, could, I think we will be looking at that in later on yeah it, it, uh, is everyone happy with this proposed initial work plan? Is your hand still up, Neil, or is it a new one? Still up. <laughs> That's Sorry. Awesome. That's all right. I should start dropping them myself whenever whenever I was asked the question. Is the committee happy with this once again? I'm yeah, happy. happy. Yeah. I'm happy. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think we have a, a consensus. So right um neil callum sorry uh i think you've got a few more of these to organize on uh the committee's behalf uh but unless has anyone else has any other uh items we can uh close the meeting and uh relax and and take a very very short trip home <laughs> very nice thank you very much guy Thank you, Guy. Okay, Neil, right. Thank you, Callum. Norris, thank you, Neil. Thank you, Callum, for organising all this. Well done, chaps. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a very good evening.